So hi, everyone, and welcome to Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein, and today I'm so happy to have a really special guest, Laura Rhodes-Levin. She is really a a person who knows so much about anxiety and um, trauma and depression and knows how to help us feel better. So um, a little bit about Laura, but then I'll let her tell you more. Um, She's a therapist and a counselor. She is um, someone who's founded um, the Missing Piece, P-E-A-C-E, very clever, Center for Anxiety. Um, And what I really like about Laura's approach is that she uses an integrative approach. So she's going to tell you more about that and and things we can do to feel better. Um, But before I um, start the interview, I also wanted to mention that she has had her work recognized by a variety of um, groups, and it's well-deserved. Um, the National Council of Jewish Women and um, the city of West Hollywood have both uh, given her awards that it, for her work, and again, well-deserved. Um, so without further ado, Laura, welcome. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much. What a great introduction. I'm <laughs> like, wow. I want to meet that woman. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And I think everybody else will too. You've done a lot though. Um, and you really have made it a mission to help people cope with some of the things that are very common but hard to treat. And so I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about the conditions you um, commonly see and what triggers them and what you think can be helpful. Absolutely. We are an unusual facility. We're an intensive outpatient program, which means people usually use their insurance. We take most PPOs. Uh, But what they do is they come to us for intensive treatment. So they'll come three hours a day, three days a week. That's, That's the smallest amount. And they're dealing with severe trauma, anxiety, and or depression. So we try and create a venue where everything's being taken care of. Can I interrupt for a second here? Did those pop-ups come onto your screen? That's They didn't, but don't worry okay. about it at all. <laughs> okay. I'm like, oh, great. There's... So just so you know, in these interviews, um, my phone has rung. Um, people's cats have walked across the screen, and I think it makes it much more approachable. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. We're all human. <laughs> all right. It's so true. I love, I love our species. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, that's one of the big things is I didn't always love our species. I was a very, I tell people all the time, underneath ang- anger is fear. Um, anger is a fight or flight mechanism. And oh, especially in today's world, I mean, throughout history, we're just, we're frightened individuals. And we tend to represent that in an angry form or in a very withdrawn form. And it makes us feel so standoffish. I mean, those are defense mechanisms. And you never look at defense mechanisms as friendly. You don't see giant stone castles. I mean, now we romanticize them as, oh, let's let's go on in. They're meant to protect you. <laughs> and what I've really learned and what I learned about myself is that I was just scared. I was very scared. And I was born scared. I don't even know why. When I was a little girl, my sister would fall asleep in two seconds and I thought there was a bear in the closet. (laughs) Uh, And I've learned to embrace my feelings, understand there are no negative or bad feelings, that some feelings are uncomfortable, but it's okay to be uncomfortable a concept that was unfamiliar to me. I went to great lengths to drug or sedate myself <laughs> to not feel uncomfortable. Um, and it's great being able to check in with all of your feelings. And and we're impacted physically, mentally, and spiritually, I think, by everything around us. And so we try and bring all those elements in to help people 
refocus on the world, realign their, I call it radio station, whatever vibration they're on, they're, they're, get, they're getting that music. And let's let's elevate that vibration so that you're you're hearing a life you want to participate in. There are so many really important things in what you just said, and I fear I will not do them justice, but I'm going to make an attempt. I think uh, you will. <laughs> but steer me, please. Um, you mentioned something people never talk about when they talk about anxiety or when they talk about depression and when they talk about um, you didn't link it to trauma, but I, I think there is so much anger below the surface, even when we come in, um, you know, as patients or we see patients as providers, people who are really struggling with fear and feeling um, paralyzed and like they can't do what they need to. Like the world itself is just too threatening. Um, or it's something they can't navigate. And the anger is something nobody talks about because so many of us are raised to not be allowed to be angry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I think some of it too, particularly in the, given the political atmosphere and the health atmosphere. Yes. Um, there has been st- so much contention, all based on fear. And here's an interesting part of it, too. There's a lot of people who've had a really good time in COVID. I, I know that sounds, <laughs> that may sound bizarre, but it's opened up a lot of um, thoughts and ideas that we never would have had. And where I've really struggled myself and, and, and helping the clients, too, is to understand we can feel compassion for the world, for the struggles of the world, for the frustrations, but we can also still enjoy our own lives. And I think there's a lot of guilt that flows over that. How can I be happy when there's so much anger and and everybody's so scared? And you're just in your living room doing crafts. You're having a great time. So is that okay? And I think the answer is yes. I think we need to do absolutely whatever it is we can to participate in however and whatever ways that means to us. Enjoy the life that you have and don't feel guilty about that. So I think that's a piece of it too, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And and again, that those are things people really don't think about when they think about all of the stressful um, things going on all of the time. And, and I agree with you. I feel like the last few years have been exponentially more stressful. And, you know, for not everybody's going to agree with that, but um, it, it can feel like such sensory overload. And anyone who may be, um, I tend to be more anxious or more easily made anxious or more easily feel hopeless, um, you know, because we all have our own wiring, right? We all have our predispositions or our, our vulnerabilities. But this past few years has really challenged people just more than any time I can remember in my lifetime. Again, I, I feel like everybody's just going off here. And when you do cut, there was a great TED Talk called Ask the Other. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. It, it may not be okay. the exact name of the TED Talk, but it was ask the other side to lunch. And Interesting. We're, we're really just, you know, we all want to be accepted. We all want to fit in. We all want love. We all want inclusion. And we're, we're, we're scared. And, and thank goodness, mental health is starting to become something that's sought out and not a shame-based topic anymore. And it makes no sense to me. You wouldn't only go to the doctor when you were like falling apart. Well, some people though, right? right? There's like a subset of people that really wouldn't go to the doctor unless they were falling apart and they wouldn't seek counseling until they were at a breaking point. Um, And I agree with you. I think that's changing. We're talking more about the importance of mental health than I can remember us ever talking about it. You know, each one of these crises 
you know, I, I think embedding what you were saying is that there are these incredible difficulties and these incredible ongoing struggles and these new kind of incredible stressors. But, you know, there we, we have within us oftentimes these strengths that we don't realize are even there. And, you know, I think my take on what you said a few moments ago was that uh, when you were saying that during the pandemic, people have kind of discovered good things in the midst of all of the stress is that, like you said, taking the time to spend time with your family or to meditate or do crafts or to just be or to make time for self-care that you might not make otherwise. That's been really, really important. And to reach out to other people, yeah. even if it can't be in person. And the, the value we place on our relationships that we used to at some point take for granted. And then on the other end of the spectrum where we we said yes to, to so many things that we, we, de- we didn't have interest in and our time was whittled away. And now what we do with our time feels much more thought out, precious, uh, exciting, something we really want to do. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you, Laura, because I know that at, at the center, you see a lot of clients who are really overwhelmed by anxiety and some people with a history of trauma. I know, I I always assume, and I don't know if I should assume this, that most people understand what I'm talking about when I talk about anxiety. Um, What are some common symptoms or common signs that people are dealing with a lot of anxiety? I'm thinking for the people who maybe aren't either are so used to being anxious that they don't recognize that that's what it is anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but as, but for those people, as well as for the people who maybe were coping okay, but have just been feeling overwhelmed for a long time, what are some signs that people are dealing with anxiety and should go get some help? Absolutely. Their anxiety affects people in so many different ways. I think one of the most common threads is that I have a sign up in my office that says anxiety is a liar that predicts doom. And I find so many people go to a worst case scenario Mm. in, in everything. So if you find yourself constantly in the worst case scenario, there's, there's so much more negative self-talk happening in your head than positive, life-affirming things, that's a good sign that you're in a scanning the environment for problems mode. And that's an important, important part of our survival. But if it's taken over and, you know, even just packing for a vacation, oh God, what if I forget this? And what if I've and I've got a pack and, and it's like, unless you're going to some very remote place, They'll have whatever it is that you will forget. (laughs) Uh, And so I think that's a really good indicator that when your negative self-talk has taken over and everything just seems like too much, your anxiety is now creeping out of the protection zone and into the making your world smaller and less enjoyable zone. You, I saw an interview you did a little while ago, um, definitely probably early in the pandemic, and you said something I thought was so important that um, people, when they're anxious and just wish the anxiety would go away, they might forget. And you mentioned something, I'm going to paraphrase, but about, you know, to some alerting, some, you know, vigilance, some concern is important. We're wired to be able to look around and notice things that could be a threat and, and, and be able to react appropriately. We don't want people to be so mellowed out that they don't (laughs) respond to anything. Right. So, you know, um, but it sounds like what you're saying is when it goes so overboard, where 
everything seems overwhelming or where somebody can't, you also mentioned in the interview about you don't want, you want to get in the car. I thought this was a terrific example you had. Um, you want to buckle up your seatbelt and adjust your mirrors, but you don't want to be paralyzed with fear and not be able to drive the car. Right. Yeah. And that's what I've spoken to. Um, that's so, that's so, I'm like, oh, she's so <laughs> um, uh, I've said through this whole pandemic, be safe, but don't be afraid. Uh, fear and panic have never been helpful, even in the most intense, stressful situations. Panic is the last thing you want. You want to be able to not be hijacked by your limbic system. And you want to be able to think clearly and, and take the next right indicated step. And, you know, I think we've entered into a shock the monkey kind of phase. I don't know if you're familiar with that experiment, but see, it's, yes. it's not just a Peter Gabriel song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now people that, know where, to, where that phrase comes from. It, probably. It, it's that if you feed a monkey and it pushes a pellet and nothing happens, food just comes out, it's fine. If it gets electric shock every time food comes out, at first it's a little jarring, but they get used to it and they're fine. It's when it gets shocked intermittently that you get a psyched out monkey. And I think news has been so conflicting in mm. this time. Um, you you literally, depending on what news channel you're watching, you're in a completely different world than right. what the other news channel is saying. And I think we're all just seeking information of what do we do? What's the right thing to do? And they've spoken about you know, this, this as a life threatening, we've got people walking around in masks. And um, it's so important to participate and to stop the spread of all this. And that's where safety comes in. Like, okay, let's be safe. Let's, let's wear the masks. Let's, you know, uh, clean and, and do all that stuff. But I feel like it's been kind of, I'm so dating myself here, but it's like land shark. You know, you're expecting to open the door and COVID like, rah, comes comes running in because the information about it is so scattered. So we don't know what to expect from moment to moment. One day, oh, it's fine. It's going away. The next day, it's not. And so if we just had a more consistent message about what levels of safety that we need, I think our limbic systems would be less uh, shock the monkey, less less erratic. We'd just be like, okay, calm. And I think there was a point where it was just like, okay, nothing's changing for months and months and months. And poor moms got used to having their kids on Zoom. And we hit this place where, okay, so this is the new status quo. And I feel like there was some a bit of calm in there somewhere. And now with everything changing again, it sort of ramped up all of that stuff. I don't know if you want to be talking about COVID so much. I don't know why my head keeps going. Here. No, it's so you know, it's just it's it's the thing that is just out there. I mean, just as an example, we we have a wedding to go to in a week and I am still conflicted about going and I've, avoid, you know, I, I am I, somebody who also has a public health background. So I'm probably someone who errs on the side of caution. And, you know, I, I've spent a lot of nights combing through Twitter, following a bunch of epidemiologists and virologists, because that's something that both amps up my anxiety, but also makes me feel calmer because I feel more prepared. Mm -hmm. um, but I can absolutely understand what you're saying about, you know, your average person probably isn't doing that. Um, and it might not be helpful if they did. It's hard when, when, it, you know, information is changing and also where you're absolutely right. It's communicated very differently from one network to another. And, um, you were saying at the beginning of the conversation, and I think it's so relevant to tie it back to this is that, um, people's fear 
you know, generates a lot of anger and everybody responds differently um, in terms of how they want to, I, I, I often refer to fear and anger as like hot potatoes that mm-hmm. are inside of us. And we want to take it out and lob it outside of us. We want to get rid of it because it's so painful. <laughs> you know, it's so uncomfortable. And we just, sometimes if we're so scared or so angry, um, we just don't care where it lands. Um, right. And I think that's where people feel really out of control. And after a while, their coping mechanisms just stop working. Um, right. So like, you know, that's, but I, but I agree most people probably would feel a lot better if it was just clear and consistent and calmly delivered, you know, and that that isn't how this has been. I I want to talk about, you know, your approach at the center um, for helping people. You've talked about the structure and, you know, the, you know, three hours a day, at least three days a week. So it is really intensive um, but I can totally see where that, you know, sometimes that's so necessary, right? Um, I, uh, you use really a, a really integrative combination of approaches. And I love that because I love that you address mind, body, brain, spirit. Cause I think that's the most effective way for most people is a multi-pronged approach. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about some of the therapies that you offer and and how you came to include them. Mm -hmm. So everybody's heard me, who's heard me speak. I say the same thing all the time. And that is that even though I think I'm a good therapist, it takes more than flour to make cake. If your dog's stressed out, you're not going to say, what triggered you fluffy? You're going to soothe this animal. And that's really what we are. We are, we are animals with a frontal cortex that wants to think about everything. So when it comes to the thinking part, we want to help people think differently about their problems and about their issues and get out of that terrified, doom-filled future. Then we work with some wonderful technology called neurofeedback and pulse electronic magnetic field therapy that's used by NASA, it's used by the armed forces. And what that does is it allows the brain to work on itself. So when our limbic system, our amygdala is overwhelmed, it needs help to calm down. And the brain knows how to, the brain's the new frontier. The brain knows how to regulate itself if given the opportunity to do so. And the interesting thing about the nine hours a week is I rarely had anyone come in here and say, oh, yeah, nine hours, done, easy, (laughs) because we are terrible at making time for ourselves. And what I love watching is they spend the nine hours, yes, in therapy, yes, doing the neurofeedback stuff, but it's also alpha stimulation to relax the brain waves while getting massage. So that is... The additional therapy, and I forget the acronym, say it again, the PULSE. PULSE Electronic Magnetic Field Therapy, which is to help communicate on a healthy frequency. It changes cellular frequency, really good for inflammation in the body and depression where things are just not flowing. And then you alter the frequency to a healthier frequency and they, they flow. So can you explain, can you create a mental picture for how this would look for a person coming in? I mean, I, I've done neurofeedback and I'm somewhat familiar with it, but I, I'm not familiar with the other technique you just mentioned with the other therapies. So I'm hoping you could kind of paint a picture. Sure. So in with the neurofeedback, you've got electrodes on your head. Mm-hmm. We don't change your brain with a frog or anything. <laughs> it's just five <laughs> yeah. electrodes that read the electrical activity that of your overwhelmed amygdala, for instance, and then they, that gets reflected back to you through a monitor. So you're sitting in a big, easy chair, and essentially your brain is looking at itself in the mirror and relaxing itself. Luckily, they've really updated the technology from when I first started, and you don't just watch fractal images of your brain anymore. <laughs> Nowadays, you can pop in a movie and sit back and watch Bridesmaids while your brain is fixing itself and and your brain waves are encoded into the movie. With PEMF, it's 
the same kind of thing. You're sitting in a big comfy Barca lounge, or, you know, like a recliner. And um, again, depending on what part of the body we're working with, we're attaching gold plated uh, electrodes, but, but much bigger to different parts of your body. And it's reading the frequencies of your body that are out of alignment and sending back the proper frequency, giving your brain uh, and your body a message of try moving to this. Like, imagine you're on a radio station and you're hearing, and it's your body making that adjustment so that the music comes through. I mean, it sounds really, really interesting. And I, and I have a feeling people really enjoy it when they're able to relax and engage in those treatments. They really do. We had a woman who had had an ectopic pregnancy, was having trouble walking. And it, it sounds so commercial to say, but after six days, she called us and she said, I danced out of the shower this morning. And she was crying and we were crying. And oh. uh, it's, it's beautiful. And then we also have halo therapy, which is like a salt cave, which is good for the immune system and um, the pulmonary system, asthma. It also just really relaxes you. Tell uh, me more about that. Halo therapy is uh, the Greek word for salt. And when you're breathing in those salt ions, uh, it changes the the air that you're breathing, really. I mean, it's just good, healthy air. And then on the ground is actual Himalayan pink salt. And when you walk on it, salt draws the toxins out of your body through your feet. So you, you go in there barefoot. Uh, we have a Zen garden with sand. So you can walk oh, along that and, and do that kind of meditative work. We work with nutrition, movement, art therapy. We have a sound bath. We've got a wonderful music therapist who teaches you how to put your emotions into an instrument or even use your body as an instrument to deal with your emotions. So that sort of that hot potato energy being channeled out in a way that just feels good and resonates in the room with you. It sounds so um, soothing in such a multi-sensory way. And in a way, most of us never... Um, take care of ourselves. Um, right. Which is what I was saying. So after nine hours a week of taking care of yourself, it's hard to say to yourself when you go back to your real life, I don't have time for me. Because now you know that you do. And you have found ways that help you relax and tools you can take with you. That's so great. And um, so how, how many weeks are people usually in treatment? So it might, I think it might three, vary. To six, three to six months usually. Okay. And um, most people stay in that they find a practitioner they love. And even when they've left the program, they'll still come in and do, you know, energy work or they'll stay with their therapist or they'll come for massage. And then it's more a la carte and insurance has nothing to do with it at that point. But okay. uh, it okay. ends up turning into a family thing because they bring in a person, they're like, fix this person. And then it turns out, well, this person didn't happen in a vacuum and let's bring in the family and the, the whole family gets better. It's, it's awesome. I, I love it. I love that you mentioned the family component because I, I completely agree that, um, you know, it's one thing for us to flourish when we're in a completely separate space and we're doing a lot of self-care. It is very different if the challengers are in the family dynamic and and then we go back. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So I love that there's a family component. I think family therapy is, um, it's just, it's invaluable. It really is. Um, and And I saw on your website that, you are actually an in-network center mm -hmm. for um, insurance, which I think is amazing because I think people are more stressed than ever financially today. Um, so oh, wow. to have insurance cover 
any of this is is really remarkable. Yeah, we're really lucky in that respect. And it's it's PPOs, we, we do HMOs with Cigna, but um, yeah, it's it's so nice. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier that we accept that you go to the doctor regularly, you get a physical, you get checkups, you do preemptive health care. Uh, and there's no reason why mental health should be treated any differently. Uh, because it affects the physical body. We, by the time people get here, they've got IBS, they've got migraines. It's like, come in before then. Stay stay healthy regularly. Absolutely. I want it to, you know, some people who will hear this podcast are on the West Coast and could come to your center much more easily. Um, for the people who can't, maybe, um, are the there are a few things that you could recommend that they do even just to start small at home to really turn down the volume on anxiety and, and fear and anger and just start to feel better mind, body, spirit. Yeah. I, I like to, to get people back in touch with the phrase, come to your senses and and really understand what I think that phrase originally meant. You know, some people can afford to take luxury vacations and go to Hawaii and stay in hotels. Some people can afford to go camping and, and be out in nature with just a tent and a pot and, and a sleeping bag. But no matter what, those are places where you very rarely care about your taxes or your boss's issues. You're, senses take over it smells good it sounds good it feels good on your skin it looks beautiful and that's why we seek out nature um and and those kind of things so what i really have tried to to bring into my life is i really try and live my like my life as much as i can as if i'm on vacation and it's possible. It's possible for every single one of us to do that. If you've had a long day, you know, at the, at the office to come home and, or during the day, you've got sound. Music is a wonderful way to Absolutely. connect to peace. Aromatherapy, essential oils are so important. It's not just that lavender relaxes you. There's so many smells that help you feel good. You can come out of a hideous staff meeting and grab a smell and just be like, okay, I'm all right. And that's going to release neurotransmitters in your head. Put pretty, like I've got the Aurora Borealis behind me. It's on my bucket list. I've never (laughs) seen it, but I want to see it right here in my office. So I love it. Make, come, let your body experience the world around you and get out of your head. Stop thinking so much, be where you are and, and enjoy, do your best to seek out the, the sensual pleasures that are available to you because that's why animals are so good. They like, Oh, where's my food? Okay. Now I'm good. (laughs) And so it's so important to, to find that in your life. So come to your senses, engage your senses, get out of your head and into the world and be present. Yeah. Really, really sage advice. My um, is an action. Absolutely. And, and, and we feel more, I think, centered when we feel like there's something we can do. Yeah, because we do have, to, you can listen to music. You can just go outside and look at the stars. And all those things going, going back to what we really started as relaxes us. It truly does. Right. Well, um, where can people find out more about um, the Missing Peace Center and your work and the wonderful therapies that you offer? So you can Google the Missing Peace, P-E-A-C-E, Center for Anxiety. Um, we do see people who are not only on the West Coast. We have three different kinds of hotels around us. We've got 
a Hampton Inn, we've got a Sheraton Inn, we've got a Four Seasons. Oh, wow. And people do come and do a monthly rate and use that as a, a base point to be able to come here. Um, and unfortunately, we can't do telehealth across state lines. Sure. But you can always uh, call and check in with us. And, and if we can guide you to someone in your area, we're always happy to do that. And, um, you know, just listening to shows like yours are, are such a good way to stay in touch with what you want to be in touch with and realize we're in more control than we realize of how we're actually feeling. So come find us or find someone near you. Oh, that's great advice. Um, Laura Rhodes Levin, thank you so much for being here. It was so nice meeting you today. Thank you, Tracy Stein. Uh, <laughs> you and, know. Uh, and this has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. If you like the episode, please remember to like and share and comment and, and be well. Mm-hmm.